It was three years ago today I brought this home, and 25,000 miles later, I got a few thoughts about it. Stay tuned. Three years ago today, I parked on this very same spot on the University of North Carolina campus and talked to you about what it felt like to finally have the Africa Twin. Today, after three years and 25,000 miles, I'm gonna tell you everything I know about this bike from the way that it works well, the way it doesn't work so well, every accessory that I've put on here, just everything I have to tell you about this bike will be in this video. All right, first off, I'd like to talk about some of the things I've learned about this bike in the three years that I've been using it. And I'll break it down a little bit into some of the different categories that I think you can break bikes down into and some of the things I've noticed. And then we'll get into all the accessories, everything I've added after that. So if that's the only thing you're concerned with, just go ahead and skip forward a little bit in this video. Initially, I moved over into this bike from a CB500X because the CB500X didn't have the speed I was looking for. We were taking trips through Mexico and topping out right in the low to mid 80s, which is more than fine for 99% of the riding that I was doing, but there were a couple of passing sections that I needed, a couple of times where I really wanted a little extra power boost and I could not get it on the CB500X. Moving over to the Africa Twin, that's never been a problem. Uh, sometimes going away from lights, I'll accelerate really quickly. I, I know that it doesn't have the same jump up that some other bikes do, but it's been more than capable for everything that I've needed, uh, including highway passing speeds, including being able to use just that little extra blip to get you out and around something or through something. Uh, before on the CB500X, if I ever had issues ahead of me and I was traveling 75 miles an hour, I would always have to slow down rather than be able to accelerate through. With the AT, I now have both of those options, which I think actually makes this bike a lot safer in a lot of ways because you have different ways that you can get past an issue that's in front of you. And sometimes the best option is to accelerate through rather than break back. But that's, everybody's got their own designs on exactly how that speed works. But on the AT, I've never had an issue with getting a top speed. Uh, this clears triple digits without even thinking about it. Uh, anytime I need acceleration, it's on demand, ready to go nice and easy. From there, everybody wants to talk about the AT off-road. Now, uh, the first year that I owned it, I took this on the Utah BDR, and I will tell you that off-road, this thing is spectacular. I know that they talk a little bit about the sponginess or the squishiness of the shocks, which I guess is sort of a personal thing on, on what you want and what's probably most effective for the type of riding that you're doing. If you want a stock upgrade or an upgrade to the stock suspension, you can get that here. That's not, that's not difficult. Um, I have not had that. I think that it works just fine for, again, the type of riding I do. This is a lot more bike than I am rider. So I'm not gonna push this beyond its capabilities, even if it does have spongier or, or slightly soft suspension. That's not gonna be a problem for me. Also off-road, uh, the DCT comes into effect. Now, I got the DCT version. I'll talk a little bit more about why that was, but off-road, the DCT, I did a whole video about it. You can see it right here. Uh, it's just incredible. It, it makes the entire calculus around off-road riding a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about the stall factor. You don't have to worry about a lot of other things that would otherwise be pretty heavy considerations off-road because you have the DCT. Now the one downside of that is in Utah, I dropped this bike fairly routinely, no big deal, just came around a corner a little bit hot, got into some sand and, and tipped over. Wasn't excessive, I don't know that I even rolled, I just kind of hit the ground and slid for a little bit. Let's call it maybe 10, 15 miles an hour. Not much, no rocks, it was all sand. But when I came down, apparently something hit the perfect spot on the plastic piece that goes over top of the DCT and it severed a wire. Now, it was imperceptible. You, you couldn't notice this hit, you couldn't see any crack in the plastic. It was, unless you actually felt right in that spot, you'd never know it was there. But it was enough to sever that wire. That wire being severed meant that I couldn't get this bike out of first gear. Now remember, we're off-road in the backwoods of Utah, uh, so there was really nowhere to go. I had a three hour journey out of there and to the closest shop doing 20 miles an hour the entire way and first gear. It was awful. Other than that, this bike has been amazing when it comes to durability and maintenance. It's held up to a ton of falls, it's held up to a ton of weather, it's held up to extreme cold, extreme heat. Everything I've thrown at this bike, it has handled 
perfectly, except for that one time with the DCT system. Talking to the, the guy who got me all fixed up there, he said, that's a one in a million shot. My crash bar goes right over that spot. So it just, it had to hit perfectly. It had to crack perfectly. It just, it was an amazing fluke that that happened. But just so you know, one of the downsides of having the high tech DCT on your bike is that if it breaks, you're sort of hosed. Um, so that's one of the downsides. But uh, other than that, I would never talk down to the DCT. I would never say don't get a DCT. I love it. I still love it. That three hour ride was, I'll call it a little bit of a relaxation time. It's nice and easy, but uh, that was one, one thing I noticed off road with this bike that was a little bit of a problem that as you add tech, off-road becomes a little bit more precarious because any breakage of that tech can sometimes leave you in a little bit of a lurch. From there, moving over into DCT just in general, I had never ridden DCT when I saw this Africa Twin. It was for sale in Kentucky and I, three years ago today, I went out there to go get it. And the first time riding it was the test drive that I did three minutes before I bought it. Uh, I'm really glad I had an opportunity to try the DCT before I bought it, but I don't know that I really understood the DCT from that little bit of a ride. It just was like, wow, oh, it's turn and go, nice and easy. Love that aspect of it. Since riding with it, I realize this just makes motorcycling a lot simpler. It, it makes everything a lot more fun. You have to be slightly more aware of your body position because you don't have that clutch, that get out of jail free card if you do happen to, to hit that throttle or get out of control a little bit, you don't have that clutch. You've got your foot brake, which means you also kind of have your have your foot on the pegs at all time, whereas before you could just pull in that clutch and, and everything would stop. Uh, the DCT requires a little bit of change in those mechanics, but still phenomenal. Just an amazing, amazing piece of machinery. I love my DCT. Uh, the hesitations I had initially of whether or not I would like it are gone. I think I might have a hard time going back to a manual after this. Uh, it's possible that the next bike I buy after this Africa Twin is just another Africa Twin DCT. People have talked about the agility on a bike like this. It's a it's a big bike. It's a tall bike. It's got a lot of uh, heft to it. And when it's like five, 600 pounds wet. Uh, but I can tell you that on 50-50 or 70-30 tires, depending on what you want to qualify them as, Motaz ADVs and Motaz GPS, I have scraped pegs on both sides of this bike. Now, that's not because I'm a good rider at all, as much as it is the bike is just really nimble, is really capable. Uh, it was a, a total fluke, it was an accident. I didn't even mean it and all of a sudden I hear and my foot's coming up off the peg. So it's, it's incredibly capable of hard turns, of tight cornering, of maneuvering and agility, even with a 21 inch front wheel. It just feels great underneath you. I've never had highway wobble. I've never had difficulty with slow motion maneuvers. Everything has been fantastic on this bike and I cannot, cannot recommend it enough for any type of riding that you're doing, but especially if you want to do multiple kinds of riding. If you're going to be doing touring, if you're going to be doing commuting, if you're going to be doing off-road, you won't find a better bike. As far as the height and comfort, it is a little bit of a taller bike. I stand 6'5", so height is not really a big issue with me. No matter how tall the bike is, I can get on a dirt bike and still put both feet flat on the ground. Uh, as far as comfort though, that is something that I was looking for. I never had an issue with my CB500X in 13, 15, 16 hour days of riding. I was perfectly comfortable on there and I was a little bit worried coming over to a different bike that I wouldn't find that same comfort level. Not a problem. The AT has always matched that, has always been capable. I've had, again, 13, 15, 16 hour days on the bike and never had any issues. No back issues, no butt issues, no leg issues, no vibration issues. Everything with the, the AT speaks towards long days in the saddle and being able to do that comfortably and getting up the next day and doing the same thing all over again. I've been very, very happy with the comfort level of this bike. To touch on really quickly, maintenance and durability, the maintenance schedule is fairly easy. Essentially every four to 8,000 miles, you've got something to do, whether that's an oil change, just kind of checking different fluids and, and clearances and things like that. It's, it's all pretty simple. And I wanna say it's 16 or 32. You've got your valve, uh, your valve clearances. I haven't done it. I know that a lot of people opted to do it and some haven't. Uh, it just doesn't seem like the sort of issue that is going to be detrimental to me. It's like a one in a million shot and I'm just taking my chances on it. Maybe if I take it into the dealership this time, I'll get that figured out. But right now it's not something that I've done. I don't see any issue with it. 
Everything has been great on this bike as far as the maintenance. It's not been difficult to do. I know the air box is a little bit tough. You gotta take a lot of plastic off in order to be able to get those filters out. It's not something I've done also at this point and haven't really had a whole lot of issue. So I'm pretty happy with the maintenance side of it and the bike's ability to run with limited maintenance. As far as the durability, again, I've dropped this bike a ton. I've thrown it around, I've ridden it hard, I've gone fast, I've uh, broken hard, I've <laughs> done anything to this bike that you possibly could over three years and never had an issue save that one time with that crazy DCT accident, which again, was a really small fix. I wanna say it was 60 bucks to replace those wires. So it wasn't a big deal, just that it was a big loss being in the middle of nowhere and only being able to get out in first gear. But I, I guess it could have been worse. So I'm happy about the fact that all the accidents I've had since then, I haven't had any durability issues. Lastly, talking about this bike when it comes to just fun and adventure, and again, specifically the DCT, this bike has no limits. There is nobody who cannot ride the AT. It's uh, super simple, it's completely approachable, it's fast enough for the experienced, it's regulated enough and kind of like tame enough that a new rider could be on here. I would suggest that maybe get used to the weight a little bit. That could be kind of an issue. If you lean up a little bit too far, this can catch a leg underneath or something. But other than fairly simple balance stuff, this is a great bike for anybody who wants to ride it. And again, I think it especially shines if you want to do multiple types of riding. There's obviously better dirt bikes out there. There's probably better uh, touring bikes out there. There's probably better, uh, you know, speed bikes, things of that nature. But if you want a little bit of all of that rolled into one, the AT is hands down, I think, the best version of that that you can get anywhere because of the fact that you've got a really agile bike that has enough power to be a lot of fun, that has enough durability and limited maintenance schedules to not be super expensive or super dangerous to work with. Just tons of capability in a bike that is accessible to everybody, has a price tag that anybody can touch. That's what makes the AT a great option. Okay, now let's get into the accessories. Everything that I've done to this bike, what I've liked, what I haven't, and, and how everything's worked over the three years that I've had the bike. I'm gonna go front to rear with everything that I have here. So if there's something specifically in the back that you're looking at, just skip forward to that portion in the video. I'm gonna start with the tires, which I know is not necessarily an accessory, but it is a choice that we make about the type of riding that we're looking to do and, and how they worked out. I'd say about 90% of the riding I've done have been on Motaz tires so far in the AT. I've ridden the GPS and the ADV, both for probably about 10, 12,000 miles. And I've been super happy with both of them. Now I'll tell you a little bit of the difference that I've noticed between the two. The ADV is clearly a much more off-road bias tire. That's the one that I had when I was on the Utah BDR. The GPS, I would say, is an everyday all-rounder. Will get you enough off-road capability that you can take a class with Brett Tax if you want to. You can do some off-roading in the Mid-Atlantic BDR. I'm guessing you could probably even do a fair amount of the Utah BDR without ever noticing an issue. But they probably aren't top-notch for off-roading just on its own. But I'd argue anybody who doesn't know specifically that they're gonna be going off-road and heavy duty off-road, stick with the GPS. It's a great tire, it's a great tire for the bike. It's a great tire for essentially any sort of riding that you wanna do and has done a fantastic job in lasting long and keeping traction in all sorts of different weather. As I had mentioned earlier, I was able to scrape pegs with the GPS and that's in just normal conditions. There was nothing crazy about it. It wasn't like super hot, it wasn't super sticky. It's just regular old conditions and this tire will grip well enough that you can drop a you can drop a peg down. Up next, I'd like to talk about the Batson screen riser. Now, on the CB500X, I had a aftermarket screen on there. It was a lot bigger, it was a lot taller, it was pushed out away and had all sorts of wind control devices on it and everything. It was super expensive also. On the AT, I found this Batson windscreen riser, which allows you to keep the standard riser and just raise it up three, four inches at a time. And I like the look of it because it keeps the riser as it is normally. I like uh, just the, the overall aesthetic, the capability of kind of going a little bit more minimalist. The fact that I can put this down and it looks like a stock bike all over again. There's no extra plastic hanging out. There's no lips up on the top. It just, it just looks a lot cleaner. And it does exactly what I needed to do. It kicks that wind up high enough that over my 6.5 head, it's not catching my visor. It's not catching the top of the helmet. I get no buffeting out of this. 
it's also a lot cheaper than going with an aftermarket windscreen. Next up, going front to back, you've got this support device that they build for the GPS hold. Now, this whole bracket here on the standard AT is not apparently the, the strongest up there. You get some people that'll bend this, especially the more weight they put on here. So the support is built in. It screws up in here and then down at the bottom. Now there's a bunch of different ones. I know Camel ADV makes this one. This is a aftermarket thing that I got from a guy on, on Facebook. I'll see if I can find the link for it, but I like this the best because it doesn't get in the way of anything else. It's kind of unobtrusive. It does what it needs to just hold a little bit tighter here, but it does no extra bars going across. The installation was pretty easy, but something like this, I would suggest for any AT owner just to have a little added support here, especially if you're mounting your GPS up here, your phone up here. If you have anything else, I used to carry my drone here. So any added weight here, you want to make sure that that's got some support on it so it's not bending those those mounts and anything that you have to replace underneath the windscreen. Up next, I'd like to talk about mascots. I think everybody should have a mascot on their bike. I have Iron Man here. It's a little keychain that I got out of uh, Barnes & Noble for 99 cents. He's gone all the way down to Central America with me through the Badlands, everything. He got moved over from the previous bike to this bike. Everybody has a mascot. There'll be a video upcoming about mascots on your bikes and how important this is, like little totems to have. I know a lot of people keep bells on their bikes or you know, crosses, whatever it is. You gotta have somebody that can kind of keep you company or you'll just start going nuts out there on the road. The next modification I made to the bike is the Rox risers here which uh, helped the handlebars come up a little bit and back towards me. Now, when I talked to Brett Tax about this, he said actually I should be moving these mounts and flipping them around because that actually brings the handlebars back a little bit further. Everything I have is kind of forward and all screwed up. So he said that I, I might actually be able to even go without these, but I'll tell you, given the current configuration, this handlebar is very comfortable for me, whether I'm standing, whether I'm sitting, everything is just really well placed so that I'm comfortable in all sorts of different riding. And it's these rocks risers that make that a possibility. Now, I know there's also a little bit of difficulty with some of these cables as you're going through. If you put too much of a rise on there, these start getting tight. I have not noticed an issue with any of those. Nothing's been sticky. Nothing's been uh, too much of a problem. This is probably about the limit, which is a two inch riser. This is probably about the limit of how far you'd want to go on these risers without some sort of cable modification. But this was a big help to let me ride standing up and to let me sit all the way back in the seat and still be very comfortable. Up next, we have the Bark Buster hand guards. Now, these things I had on my CB500X. The wind kicking up over the top of your hands, especially in North Carolina winters, is really vitally important. On the CB500X, I never really had an issue with the, uh, the bar underneath. I never had an issue with anything hitting that would have crushed my previous my previous hand guards on the at though especially out in utah and doing the off-riding that off-road riding that i've done this has been paramount i have saved probably plenty of handles and my own hands by having this reinforced bar under here this steel bar runs all the way through goes handlebar to handlebar so you don't have any sort of uh, extra metal that's sticking to other parts of the the handlebars this is really nice and easy it's out of the way and i'll tell you the scrapes that are on here from the rocks in utah and the trees in the mid-atlantic and all the other riding that i've done makes me really happy to have these bark busters this would be one of the first modifications i would put on any new bike that i get just to make sure that you're not breaking levers you're not crushing your hand, things that uh, come out of nowhere, just simple branches or bugs or rocks on the road. This is a great way to get those off of your fingers, off of your hands, so that you don't have any injuries or any problems with the bike. And they're relatively cheap and easy enough to install that you can get this done in, in less than a couple of hours. The next item I'd like to talk about is the fork shield. It's just a little piece of plastic in here. Now, uh, the craziest thing, I don't know how the engineers got away with this. I don't know how this wasn't dealt with, but Almost every new AT rider has serious buffeting issues with their helmet. Some get bigger screens, some change different elements of their bike, sometimes their helmet, they take their peak off. Any a new AT rider needs to get a fork shield first. They run from 12 bucks to 25, 30, 50 if you want to get them engraved, but it's a cheap piece of plastic that you can get installed in three minutes and it can change the airflow dynamics of your bike. All the air that's coming up through this the the fork hole 
is now deflected enough that it's not running directly into your face or directly into your helmet. It is a godsend that this is a cheap item that you can get, that everybody has found it, that it's on here. It's not a secret. Talk to any AT owner. All of them have fork shields because of that buffeting issue. This is one of those things that I had before I even had the bike because I knew it was gonna be a problem. I hadn't installed it immediately when I first took my first ride and recognized huge buffeting problems. Tried this out, immediately solved them. It is awesome how well this is engineered to take care of such a simple problem. Up next, I've got my quad lock. This is the way that I mount my phone to the bike. I had one of the Ramball X type of things, the, the squeezy spring things, and it was fine. It worked well. I didn't like how the feet and the cups came off all the time, but on this one, it's such an easy one-handed operation to get the, <laughs> normally one-handed, it's an easy one-handed operation to get the phone on and off and that you can do it while you're riding. I can't get enough of how simple the quad lock is on this bike. I, I, I love uh, the lock on here. I love how secure it is. I love that every now and again, I just have to tighten this up to make sure everything's where it belongs. Whereas the X, you know, you never really knew how your spring was gonna hold or if something could rip it out of there. This is locked on there. It's not uh, any more expensive than the X either. So it's a, it's a great deal. Anybody who's looking in a way to mount their phone on their bike, quad lock is the way to go. All right, up next, I'm gonna talk about my entire alt rider system. So I've got bars on the top, I've got bars on the bottom, and then I've got the middle bar here, which kind of connects the two via these little blocks here. You can buy any one of these separate. Uh, you can buy just the tops, you can buy just the bottoms, you can buy top and bottom without this connector piece, and you can put the connector piece in later, depending on what your budget is or what type of riding you're thinking you're gonna do. I cannot suggest these enough. I know that Outback Motor Tech has got really good bars on theirs as well. In fact, my uh, teammate in the Be Gone For Good channel, he's always on the rides with me. He's got the Outback Motor Tech on his bike and seems to really like them, but I think the alt riders are just the best. I, I do not think you can get better than this, um, partially because of the way that the install is and they're all attached to frame mounts. It's all very clean stuff. I know the Outback Motor Tech can come all the way back here and kind of mount to the frame back here and kind of seemingly gets in the way to me. But uh, the Alt Riders have taken tons of falls in Utah. They are scraped up significantly. They've never bent into the, the fairings. They have never bent anywhere, really. It's all been really good at protecting all of the vital engine parts. I wrapped mine in paracord, 550 cord. Uh, one, for an aesthetic, but two, also just to kind of make sure that I've got a little extra uh, 550 cord if I need it. It's kind of an emergency capability there if I if I have to have it. But the bars themselves, the install is really easy. The problem with the way that the AT and the bars are all constructed is you kind of have to you have to pick a team. You got to be Outback Motor Tech and you got to be Outback Motor Tech all the way through, or you've got to be Alt Rider all the way through because the skid plates and and everything that's going to go with it has to all match. So I stuck with Alt Rider. I've been really happy with their skid plate as well. Uh, again, in Utah, the rocks, the things that I, I crossed up on, the skid plate has done an amazing job. I pulled the skid plate off for every oil change and I've never had any issues with it. It's uh, no dents, no cracks, no stress marks, anything. There's a bunch of dings in there, but nothing has impeded that plate so much as to be, to be problematic. Now, for the center stand plate, that one took some solid hits in Utah and bent it so badly that it actually broke off the mounts, which are just plastic. So the failure point was really the plastic more so than the plate. And then it slid it back into the rear tire. So I had to remove the whole thing in order to be able to move again. But the plate itself held up really well. And whatever it is that hit that, I'm really glad it didn't hit any of the mechanism that is uh, in and around the center stand instead. So the plate did its job, but it would have been nice to have those mounts be metal instead of plastic so that it wouldn't have just torn off or wouldn't have gotten to a place where I had to tear it off or I couldn't remount it once I pounded that all back out. The plastic was essentially destroyed, so couldn't use it again. If it had been metal or a little bit more robust metal pieces, maybe I could have, I could have used that again. Uh, but yeah, the Alt Rider system is just, it's just amazing. And again, from all of the different marks that I've had on here, I've not had any rust issues. I don't have any issues with it bending or warping in any unusual way. The Alt Rider has been a phenomenal system for this bike. I think it looks good. They've got a bunch of different colorways to match the AT colorways and, and they do exactly what you need them to do. And it's an expensive system, but definitely well worth it if you plan on going off-road at all. 
Up next, you have the center stand. Now this is an OEM center stand. This is from Honda. I know that there are other companies that make center stands out there that you can put on here, but the Honda seems like the best fit, the one that makes the most sense. It's built by Honda for Honda. There is a trick to getting these springs on here. There's two springs that hold this center stand on. You can beat your knuckles to death. You can buy tools. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff that are just brutal, or you can use my trick which is also with 550 cord or a pair of line, anything that you can strap to the rear tire to make it happen, and it's super simple. I was amazed at how easy that trick was, and it gets those springs on there, and you never have to worry about them again, and you don't have to beat anything up on the bike or yourself to get it done. Great center stand. This is another thing that I would advise you getting if you plan on doing regular chain maintenance, if you plan on having any time where you need to take the tire off, especially out in the field. This is a great thing to have on the bike one of the first things that i installed super easy install and once it's on there you'll use it a lot more than you think anybody who has watched this channel for any amount of time knows that i love my moscow gear i've got a bunch of different reviews for the moscow moto nomad i've got for the reckless 80 for different other items that i have from moscow uh, in fact you can see it up in the corner right now i've got my moscow moto nomad review great gear uh, I think everybody, if you're going to be doing touring, if you're going to be doing off-roading, you need some sort of luggage system, something to carry some stuff on you, even if it's just water. I think Moscow does that really well because they're all riders also. So the Moscow gear comes with the added experience of somebody who's been there before you. So they've got pockets in places that you'll eventually need pockets. They've got baggage and waterproof capabilities and just all sorts of things engineered into their products that you might not otherwise think of as a new rider or even as somebody that's just starting out buying luggage. Great stuff, engineered well, perfect customer service, a little bit on the expensive side, but durable enough that it's gonna last long enough to make it a, a value for you long into the future. Up next, I've got my night design foot pegs. Like I said, these things have been scraped, so they uh, are definitely sticking out quite a ways. They are super comfortable. They are nice wide footbed, they grab, with these lugs into my shoes and my boots very well. They're an easy install. Uh, they do have a, a little bit more aggressive tread pattern here if you're gonna be in a lot more mud or a lot more off-road than the, the standard. Uh, it's just a really high quality product. Again, a little expensive, so you can probably find a cheaper option that does most of what you need to do. But I had these since probably the first week of ownership. So for three years, these have been on the bike and I've never had an issue with them. I've never had a problem from the moment that I bought them till now, they have performed exactly as expected. All right, the last accessories that I'd like to talk about that I added to the bike, which were actually strangely some of the first that I put on the bike are the pillion plate and the rear luggage rack. Now these are both from Altrider also. Again, I'm a big fan of the company. They've done a really good job with all of their products, but it's nice solid uh, metal on here on both sides. There's a ton of strap down points. So anything that you need to be able to strap on here, any different sort of cord that you're gonna be using, if it's just a helmet carrier, it can go here. If it's something more robust, a little bit heavier straps, if you've got your full luggage system, there's plenty of tie down points on here. Uh, on the rear luggage point, they also have roto packs. Uh, pattern in here so if you want to put roto packs on here you can do that just everything seems to be thought about it's light enough that it doesn't feel like a, a massive steel plate back here but it's also strong enough that again you can drop it you can run it into things and I don't have any bends I don't have any kinks there's no warping in this it's just a really great product the holes uh, to be able to screw in or the nuts to be able to the bolts to be able to screw this in uh, are also really strong and capable. They're easy to pop out, easy to get in, and it feels very secure. I keep a lot of gear underneath this plate, so it's important that this is strong enough and secure enough that nobody's gonna be getting underneath there. And these plates so far have done everything that I've wanted to do and a whole lot more since the day I bought them. I have just gotten happier and happier with their capabilities. So that's a run through of all of the accessories that I've put on the AT. Everything that I have on here that I have utilized over the three years, 25,000 miles that I've gone, I've been super happy with everything. Nothing has been a negative purchase. Everything has helped me in the rides that I've taken to be more comfortable, to be more rugged, to be more capable. All of it has been fantastic. The bike itself is top notch. I, I cannot speak highly enough about the AT. I was a fan of Honda beforehand. As I said before, 
I like this bike so much that the chances are that when I am looking to buy another bike in probably the next couple of years, it will be an AT first. It will probably be a DCT as well. I just, I can't imagine a bike being more capable, more readily available, more approachable, uh, more affordable than the AT has been. And I look forward to rebuying this bike in a couple of years. If you have any questions for me, anything that I didn't hit, or you wanna know more about specific items on the bike, definitely leave a comment down below. If there's anything I've missed, if there's accessories that I don't have that I should, I also wanna hear a comment down below because I'm always into new gear. I always love finding new stuff, especially if it makes my ride a little bit better. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. This is Chad with Be Gone For Good. Again, we do videos all about adventure motorcycling from the bikes that we use, top to bottom, to the trips we're taking, the gear that we're on, everything under the sun when it comes to adventure motorcycling, you're gonna find it on this channel. I've also got a review of my training class with Brett Tax coming out shortly. If that's the sort of thing that interests you, definitely subscribe to the channel because that will be coming pretty soon. It was an amazing time to be out there training with those guys, uh, true professionals. The crew was great, the environment was amazing, learned a ton, even though I was hardly on the bike. It was just, it was incredible. And I look forward to bringing that to you very shortly. So again, remember, the adventure starts with you, up here and in here. I'll see you in the next one.